Okay, so now let's uh, start admitting people. Okay. okay. Okay, uh, Dr. Public, when you're ready, we may begin. Okay, thank you, Aito. Okay, I think we can begin. So hello, everyone, and greetings from the TRACES Laboratory here at the RIT in Ateneo de Manila University. Welcome to our archaeology webinar series that presents current research and new discoveries in archaeology and paleoecology. It's our great pleasure to have as today's speaker, Dr. Thomas Inchiko, Professor of Paleoanthropology at the Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle in Paris. Dr. Inchiko has been working for over a decade in Southeast Asia and he conducted research in Indonesia and the Philippines. He's a specialist for the early peopling of island Southeast Asia and an expert for the Pleistocene fauna of the region. Dr. Inchiko has been a professor at the University of the Philippines for several years, where he was in charge of the Zoo Archaeology Laboratory in Upitiliman. He is a research associate of the National Museum of the Philippines and his collaboration with the National Museum was proven particularly fruitful when they succeeded in the discovery of an almost complete skeleton of a butchered rhinoceros associated with numerous stone tools at the site of Rizal in Kalinga, northern Luzon. The rhinoceros and its context have been dated to an age of more than 700,000 years ago, which marks the earliest evidence of human presence in the Philippines. 
to my end, I have collaborated uh, in another multidisciplinary research project on the island of Mindoro, where we investigate several sites that were occupied by early modern humans and the first seafarers that reached the oceanic islands of the Philippines. Dr. Inchiko is an affiliate research fellow of the anthropological and sociological initiatives of the Ateneo, Asia in short, and the Traces Laboratory. Our respondent for this webinar is Ms. Mylene Leasing of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology of Ateneo de Manila University and the Prehistoric Archaeology Department of the Goethe University Frankfurt in Germany. The host and manager of this webinar is again Mr. Aido Balboa from the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, who will also lead through the question and answer section. On behalf of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and ASEA, the Anthropological and Sociological Initiatives of the Ateneo, I like to thank the people and institutions that made this webinar series possible. The members of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, the School of Social Sciences, the Office of the Vice President for University and Global Relations, Kalipunang Sociologia and Anthropologia, Arete, the Creativity and Innovation Hub of the Ateneo de Manila University, and the Eduardo J. Aboites Sandbox Zone. Now, without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Toma Inchiko and his talk on early peopling of the Philippines. Who were they and how did they get there? Thank you very much and thank you, Toma. Well, thank you, Dr. Pavlik. Thank you, first of all, for the invitation. Thank you to the uh, Ateo de Manila University for the invitation, and especially to the, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology of the university. I'll try to launch my PowerPoint. Here you go. So, yeah. Okay. And All right. So as Dr. Pravik uh, presented, um, we'll talk this mo uh, this um, today. Uh, sorry, I was going to say this morning because it's morning in France, but it's the afternoon for you. So uh, this afternoon about uh, earliest peopling in the Philippines. Talking about early peopling of uh, our genus, the genus Homo, is uh, first of all, um, related, of course, to the uh, first uh, out of Africa of our genus. As Homo sapiens, we belong to the genus Homo, and you, as you may know, our genus originated in Africa sometime about 2 or 2.4 million years ago. Several species of the genus Homo are known in Africa, but the earliest that are supposed to go out of this continent is Homo erectus, passing by Georgia, as you can see on this map, about 1.8 million years ago, and arriving to China, where we do have uh, evidences of early human presence by 2 million years ago, um, by some stone tools found in uh, loess formation, so uh, wind deposited sediments in China, dated to 2 million years ago. Their arrival in uh, islands of East Asia uh, dates back to 1.5 million years ago, or about 1.5 million years ago, but the date is debated. That is the, the very earliest migration wave out of Africa of our own genus. But although our genus went out of Africa, other species of the same genus, still Homo erectus in Africa, continue to evolve there and give rise to other species, our own species, Homo sapiens, 
who appeared first in Africa about 500,000 years ago or so. Or at least we have fossils there in Africa that look like Homo sapiens and that we call archaic Homo sapiens. These archaic Homo sapiens are supposed to go out of Africa again, so a second wave. And we have evidences by 200 or 300,000 years ago in China and maybe also in Indonesia, but this is debated. We are still unclear whether these are evolved, locally evolved Homo erectus or new arrival, new immigrants. What is true is that these archaic Homo sapiens are still evolving in Africa. Again, some of the population stayed in Africa and continued to evolve while others colonized the rest of the world. And while evolving there gave rise to Homo sapiens, just like our own species looks like. This is exactly the skull of a Homo sapiens, just like ours, that is dated to 150,000 years ago in Africa. And again, a third wave out of Africa of Homo sapiens, modern human, our own species, by about 100,000 years ago, and then colonizing the rest of the world arriving to islands of East Asia about 70,000 years ago, we have one remain in um, Sumatra Island on Indonesia. So to summarize, we have several species. We have first Homo erectus that colonized parts of Asia. These are the small skull caps here that you have in red or orange. The color is related to the time. Here you have the time from 2 million years until 10,000 years, just like a clock. And about 1.5 million years ago, you already have fossils in China and Indonesia on the island of Java, and these are Homo erectus. These um, fossils will be replaced by Homo sapiens, these are the green one, the recent part of the chronology here. And the oldest one are in Sumatra by 70,000 years ago, just like I told you just before. Recently discovered on the island of Flores, dated to about 100,000 years ago, a bit less, 90,000 years ago another species that is only known in this part of the world, unlike Homo erectus and Homo sapiens that are known in Europe and in Africa. Homo floresiensis from the island of Flores and most likely arrived there about 1 million years ago, because we do have stone tools on the island of Flores dated to 1 million years ago. So one million years ago, this means by a time that Homo erectus was already in Indonesia, on the island of Java, and the time when Homo sapiens did not arrive yet because it arrived about 70,000 years ago. So we have a different species, Homo floresiensis, that is present on an island, the small island of Flores, and that might be related to Homo erectus. And more recently, again, Another species in the Philippines this time, that is Homo luzonensis, on the island of Luzon. And that is dated to about 70,000 years ago, a bit less, a bit more. We are still unsure about that. So in fact, you have a huge diversity, quite a huge diversity for this part of the world of human species. And therefore, talking about early arrival in islands of Asia means dealing with these different species. I took the example of Homo floresiensis with this skull here that is dated to 90,000 years ago on the island of Flores, but who arrived 1 million years ago. The same question arises here in the Philippines when you have this species, Homo luzonensis, dated to 70,000 years ago. And the question is, if you have a species of the genus Homo that is specific to the island of Flores by um, 70,000 years ago, it means that 
its ancestor arrived much before and could be uh, could have arrived by the same time as uh, Flores Island was colonized, meaning in more simple terms that since 1.5 million years ago, you have Homo erectus in several localities of Asia and Southeast Asia and Islands of East Asia. Therefore, you could expect that the ancestor of Homo lusensis arrived on the island of Luzon since 1.5 million years ago. Or at least you can try to search for fossils dating back to that, to that time and much older than 70,000 years ago. Because a species named Homo lusensis on the island of Flores is the result of a local evolution, so an old arrival. So Homo lusensis is a fantastic discovery, but knowing when and where it came, for that, to answer this question, you have to search in all the sedimentary layers. So that's what we did. Here you have the different sites contemporaneous with the Homo lusensis fossil. That's the sites of Calo, Calo Cave, in the Peña Blanca uh, range. And you have the different archaeological sites that are contemporaneous in Island Cist Asia, and all of these are Homo sapiens. So before the discovery of uh, this Homo lusonensis from Calo Cave, the oldest human presence in the Philippines was the famous Taban Cave on Palawan Island with dates that are between 30 and 40,000 years ago. This is this uh, bone hair of the forehead of a Homo sapiens. So, Searching for the ancestor of Homo lusensis means going to search for all the archaeological layers. And an archaic fauna is known since several years in the north of the Philippines on the island of Luzon, not far from Calo Cave, actually. Here is Calo Cave on the Sierra Madre along the Peña Blanca Ridge. You cross the Cayenne River, you drive for about two hours, and you arrive to Rizal, Kalinga, in Kalinga province. And there, where you have the red star here, you have fossils that are known since uh, about 100 years in the Philippines. Here's a letter from the archives, from a mining geologist, Lawrence Wilson, to who was reported uh, the discovery of uh, fossils of a giant animal in the Philippines that was discovered by uh, school teachers in uh, the 1930s. So as a mining geologist, he went there on the sites and search for uh, other traces of those giant animals. He didn't find much, but he was accompanied by a famous uh, German paleontologist who was working on the Homo erectus from Indonesia, that is Ralph von Königswald. And with Ralph von Königswald, they discovered on the surface, not far from uh, the supposed location of this uh, bone of a giant uh, animal, prehistoric animal, stone artifacts. And for von Königswald, who was working on Homo erectus sites in Indonesia, those stone artifacts were clearly archaic, meaning they could be related to the same period from which Homo erectus belonged in Indonesia. This is the archive of Lawrence Wilson, and this bone of a giant animal, prehistoric animal in the Philippines is the bone of uh, rhinoceros. And here you have the uh, potential location of the rhino fossils as reported to Wilson. So you have to be here and you see the area where uh, they were surveying on surface. You have different pictures of this survey, searching for more fossils and more stone artifacts. 
Unfortunately for them, they were not uh, able to find more, but at least it reached, uh, it, um, it launched uh, the interest of several archaeologists after them. This is von Königswald I was mentioning to you, who described the rhino fossil from Luzon on the invitation of Otley Bayer, the anthropologist of uh, the University of the Philippines. And uh, his uh, von Königswald with Otley Bayer, and would um, describe the stone artifacts from northern Luzon and the fossil mammals that was given to him, but that he didn't find on surface. And here you have a, a cut from a, a newspaper of this uh, search for old fossils, and that was in 1950s. So since the 1950s, at least, but based on fossils discovered in 1930s, we know that there are archaic animals, prehistoric animals in the Philippines. And these prehistoric animals, like rhinos, are comparable to Indonesian um, fossils, uh, contemporaneous with Homo erectus. So one could suspect, since the 1950s, that there would be an early presence, not only of animals, but maybe also of humans, in the islands of the Philippines. Again, the map made by uh, Wilson and by Bayer of the different localities. And this is a close up. And you can see the uh, frontier between uh, the Cayenne province and the Mountain province. And you can, uh, and Solana, and you can uh, go back there and search for fossils and archaeological sites and expect to find maybe the ancestor of Homo luzonensis. So that's what we did. And that's what archaeologists of the National Museum did. So first in the 1970s, Robert Fox, the one who uh, excavating the Tabon Caves, went to the uh, uh, Cayenne Valley, so on the western bank of the Cayenne Valley, where the rhino fossils were reported and the stone artifacts by Van Kingswald were re reported to search for this early presence of humans in the Philippines. Here are some of the tool stone tools you can find on surface. These are simply modified pebbles on one side, called chopper or chopping tools, unifacial pebbles, modified pebbles. And they excavated several uh, localities there. They found many artifacts on the surface, so out of any stratigraphic context. And they found only a few uh, archaeological material buried in the sediments. It is important to mention that uh, these were buried in the sediments because as long as they are buried in the sediments, you can be sure that they are old. And by studying the sediments, you can even know the age of this uh, archaeological material. While when they are, whenever they are on surface, you can over, always doubt that this is a mix of old um, rhino bones and recent stone artifacts. And therefore, you cannot prove that the stone artifacts are the same age with the rhino fossils. So this is why Robert Fox decided to excavate to search for stone tools in the same layers with the rhino bones. He didn't find rhino, but he find a related uh, animal to the elephants that we name Stegodon. And here you have fossils, we don't see very well, but you have fossil of Stegodon here, so like an elephant that used to roam in the Philippines in this archaeological layer. He also find two stone artifacts, but unfortunately, uh, unfortunately for him, these own artifacts were found in a layer above the uh, Stegodon uh, layer. So if they are above, they are more recent, but you don't know how more recent they are. So you could not prove that humans were present by the same time as Stegodons or rhinos in the Philippines. In 2007, uh, Clyde Jagohan from the National Museum also went there to the same place and try also to excavate. This is the picture you have here and to search for fossils, but unfortunately did not succeed neither. 
Lastly, in 2001, John DeVos and Angel Bautista, so from the Naturalist Biodiversity Center in uh, Netherlands and Angel Bautista from the National Museum of the Philippines, also went there and opened an excavation square. They found in the same layer, this is the tusk of this stegodon, so this uh, cousin of the elephants. And in the same layer, you have stone artifacts, such as this one, small flakes, that are found along, along with the, um, the tusk. So one could say that they are contemporaneous. Finally, they discovered it. Unfortunately, as you can see, this is not deep. So this is not surface, but it is almost surface. It's the present day soil. And we, because it's the present day soil, you cannot know if this is also a mixture or this is an archaic association. So although they found from the same layer stone artifacts and uh, prehistoric animals, they couldn't be sure that they were really associated. So building on that, we decided to go back by ourselves in um, 2014 to the same area to survey first and then to open an excavation square. On our survey, we found several uh, archaeological material on surface that um, confirmed to us that there was many, uh, most likely a potential in this area to find uh, early peopling of the Philippines. We found several of these elements that we call tectites. And these tectites are the result of the impact of uh, uh, meteorites in southern China. So you had a meteorite that uh, impacted southern China 800,000 years ago and uh, sent in the uh, upper atmosphere uh, sediment that crystallized and fall back on Earth and disseminated all over Southeast Asia. And some of these uh, meteorite related uh, sediments, so tectites, are found in the Philippines. So because we found many of those tectites on the surface in the area, we knew that one were not older than 800,000 years ago. And second, that if we have so many, maybe we were not uh, much younger than this event. So much younger than 800,000 years ago. So most likely we were about 800,000 years ago. So that was an indication for the age of these fossils, the one we could find on surface because those fossils were still undated, although just by comparing them with the one you have in Indonesia, you could suspect they were quite old. And on surface, we also found not only rhino and stegodon, but also other type of animal, just like this uh, canine of, uh, of a pig, but a pig with huge canine. I will show you a, a representation of this pig later on in this PowerPoint, in this presentation. <clears throat> so that's a, a, a pig with huge canine, and that belongs to a new species and fossils that we didn't know before in the Philippines and that we knew only in one place in Southeast Asia, that is Sulawesi Island in Indonesia. And Sulawesi Island that is located in the south of the Philippines. So by finding these fossils, we also had the indication that once upon in a time, you had connection between the Philippines and Sulawesi. So this means migration either from north to south, north to south, either from south to north. So this was quite interesting because even if we couldn't find any um, human fossils or presence of uh, early humans in the Philippines, at least we had uh, some interesting information about past migration of animals 
in Ireland Southeast Asia, and that, um, that was totally new, and that decided us to open an excavation square. So we collected everything on the surface, stone tools, tectiles, animals, so for now, we put them on a map and we uh, discovered that they were always related. That whenever you had uh, fossil fauna, you had stone tools and you had tectites. So this could mean just on surface, from surface findings, that you have tectites, so you are about 800,000 years ago, the fauna are 800,000 years ago, and the stone tools as well. But to confirm that, you have to excavate. So this is what we did in 2014, 2015. That's the site of Kalinga here. We are in a small valley that is uh, 10 meters high from top to bo the bottom of the valley. So you have, during the rainy season, you have a small stream that is flowing here. And we opened several trenches on each side of the valley and at the bottom of the trenches and at the bottom of the valley, we opened an excavation square. We found a tectite in the layer, as you can see here. And we found several bones, as you have here. And these are bones of a rhinoceros. Bone of rhinoceros, but also stone artifacts. This is a stone tool, this is a flake, and this is in the same layer with the tectite and the rib of the rhino I've shown you before. And not only flakes, but also um, cores. So you have a pebble, you remove some flakes to make some tools, and what remains are the cores. So you have the production of the flake and uh, what results from the production of the flake as well. So you have several steps of uh, the cultural activities of the people that used to be here. And these are in the same layer. Here you have a flake, a stone tool, that is just next two bones of this rhinoceros. So clearly they were the same age. These are the flakes and the stone tools. You have a hammerstone that you use, this hammerstone, to nap on the pebble and to remove flakes. Hammerstone, this is the pebble from which some flakes have been, have been removed. And these have been removed by a specific technique. And the flakes that are produced and that you will use as tools to butcher the rhino. I said produced by a specific technique, and this technique is percussion on anvil. This means that you put this pebble on a larger pebble that we name a anvil, an anvil. You nap it, you remove a flake by the counter shock. So from napping with your hammer stone, you produce energy, and this energy wave disperses until the anvil and then bounces back, and that helps you to remove a flake. And they use this method because the uh, pebbles are of very bad quality to nap. It's very difficult to remove any flakes because of the quality, the very bad quality of the pebbles found in the area. So yeah, they have to use this method. And because they have to use this method, they could only produce a limited number of stone artifacts and of poor quality as well. These are simple flakes, very simple, very small dimension, and this is directly related to the quality of the pebbles, but also of the size of the pebbles. The pebbles in the area are all quite small, and therefore you can only produce small uh, stone tools. I'm saying that because we have the idea in uh, Asia, but not only in Asia, that by this period, uh, early uh, humans in Ireland Southeast Asia were producing very large tools. And this is true. They used to do so. 
And you have a fantastic example in the Philippines that has been discovered by Dr. Pavlik on the site of Arubo. That is this hand axe, that is a large, very large stone tools that has been uh, fascinated by removing several flakes and then retouching it a bit to shape it in the form of a bypass. So uh, two uh, symmetry of on this uh, modified pebble. But this is only possible when you have uh, large pebbles in the area. And that the raw material is of quite good quality, so you can uh, shape it the way you want. This, is to this was totally impossible in Kalinga. And therefore, they could not produce this kind of tools. Although this kind of tool is also old and could be the same age as the Kalinga uh, stone tools. It's just that in Kalinga, they could not produce that. So all you have in Kalinga, this is this type of flakes. And this type of flakes, that's you have the pebble, and this is the external face of the pebble. And you see, they just remove one flake from this pebble, and this is what you obtain. And they use that as tools. But the raw material was very bad quality in Kalinga because it was uh, very hard. So very hard, so very difficult to remove a flake. But also because it was very hard, a simple flake like that had a very cutting cutting edge, a very sharp cutting edge. And therefore, this very bad quality uh, stone tool was actually uh, perfect to butcher a large animal like a rhino. So they could not produce more, but they did not need to produce more. And I'm saying about uh, these stone tools to butcher rhino, because indeed we have rhino and we have butchery marks. We not only have rhino, we also have larger animals. This is the molar, so the tooth of a stegodon, this cousin of the, the elephants. But we also have small animals, small animals We have molar of a Philippine brown deer. And we have even smaller things like monitor lizard or like uh, turtle, box turtle. This is the fossil one we have in Kalinga and this is the comparative one, so a modern one. And you see that it is exactly the same. So there are no differences at all. The same for the monitor lizard. This is the bone of the monitor lizard and this is the comparison with the modern one. There are little differences. So these um, uh, animals in, uh, were already present uh, in the Philippines about 800 years ago by the time the tectite accumulated. So we have a rhino and this rhino is almost complete. You see different bones here. The completeness of the rhino is represented by the gray areas. So most of the long bones so of the legs are represented. Part of the skull is preserved as well. Several uh, uh, bones from the spine are, are there as well. We have teeth and we have several of the long bones. So that's a quite good preservation. And you have butchery activity, as Dr. Pavlik mentioned in the introduction, butchery activities on several of the bones of this rhino. You have cutting marks on several of the ribs, but also on some of the bones from the feet. You also have percussion marks on some of the long bones. And this is what you have here. This is not the natural shape of the bone. This is a percussion mark, meaning that they took a stone, a pebble, and they uh, tried to break the bone by uh, Percussion. So this is how we found this rhino. Almost complete and most of the bones uh, packed in a two by two square meter. So it, that's quite a small area for such a large animal. So they accumulated here. These are the stone artifacts we found. One of the core from which you remove flakes some of the flakes we found, and some of the cut marks that we identified right away while excavating it. 
this is a rib, and here you have two cutting marks that we identify while excavating. This is the bone still in the sediment. Just above that, that's quite interesting, this uh, orangey, browny uh, thing here, and you have a close-up here, that's a fragment of a wood, fresh wood, log wood. And the sediment that was good enough to preserve on such an old site very small animals, like uh, turtle or um, monitor lizard, was also good enough to preserve wood, fresh wood. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but you can see some of the cells of the wood here, this elongation of this uh, coloration here. These are the cells of the wood. So we also have wood that was preserved here. Some of the cut marks on the bones, I told you, that's uh, bone from the foot, and you have several cutting marks, butchery marks, another cutting mark on one of the ribs that you can see here quite clearly. So the rhino was butchered and was butchered with the simple flakes they produced in Kalinga. One of the percussion marks you have on the long bone, bone of the leg here. So this wall area has been pressured by uh, the percussion of, uh, of a pebble. But you can see that they did not succeed to break the bone. Because the bones of the rhino are very thick, very heavy, and it's not easy to break them. So they did not succeed to break this one. But it's opposite one on the other side of the animal. They succeeded to break the humerus, this long bone. And you see the percussion area. And this one was found in three pieces. So they did not succeed to break this one, but they succeeded to break this one. So you remove the skin and the flesh that creates cutting marks. From that, you get the meat. And once you get the meat, you can try to break the bones. Sometimes you miss it, and sometimes you succeed, just to try to get the marrow. And I think that uh, for the one who, of you, you who attended the talk of Dr. Volmer, a few weeks ago, she explained you why it is interesting for these early humans to get the marrow. I think she made a comparison with Bulalo. <clears throat> so the percussion mark, but we not only have percussion marks, we also have uh, other marks on the surface of several of the bones. That's uh, the lower leg of the rhino, and this is also damaged. But that was naturally damaged. This is by comparison a 14, 14 million years old uh, rhino same bone from Spain by a time where humans were not there. And you have the same mark, compression mark. So this is clearly not related to human activity, it's just related to the compaction of the sediments. So that's the pressure of the sediment that breaks the bone, because for such a long period, the bones are a bit compressed by the sediments, and you do not find them totally intact, as they used to be 800,000 years ago. So you have natural compression, and you also have other animals in the area. So although we didn't find the presence of any rodent, any rats, we have on this bone from the monitor lizard, knowing marks, so clearly, a rat was there 800,000 years ago, although we didn't find it. We found the activity of this, uh, the, of this rat while he was eating these bones and the, the remaining flesh on this uh, monitor lizard bone. Okay. So we excavated, we removed the rhino that was over there, and we continued to excavate. And then we try to analyze the surface of this uh, archaeological material. So we know that humans represent by the same time as rhino in the Philippines, that those humans used to consume, to eat, to butcher the rhino for the flesh, for the marrow. Could we know more? Could we know about the social organization of those humans? How they used to gather 
around this rhino and to uh, share the activities to butcher it, to produce the stone tools? Could we reach this kind of information that are quite interesting for us to better know those early humans? But for that, you first have to be sure about what you have in hands. Having rhino bones with butchery marks, that proves you that uh, the rhino was eaten. But if you want to know about the social organization, you have to investigate the spatial distribution of the archaeological material. If you have a group of early humans that gathered around the rhino to butcher it, then you should look at the bones of the rhino and the artifacts surrounding the rhino to see if you can find different activities related to different people and how they relate. So that's what we did. We tried to investigate the distribution pattern of the different bones and stone tools we found in the area. This is the drawing we made of the excavation. In blue, you have the rhino bones. So you see one of the femur here of the lower leg. You see here the upper leg, the one I've shown you before, the humerus, that the one that has been broken in three pieces, one, two, and three pieces. So every bone is represented here, every stone, and every stone tools as well. If you look at the um, The sediment here on which the, uh, the fossils and the stone tools were lying, you can see that you have what looks like a small valley. This is the bed of a stream that used to flow there, and you have the direction of this stream. This is what you can see here. You have the banks here, and in the middle, you have this stream. And you can see that several of the bones are along this stream. Some are even inside this stream. So that tells you that this rhino is lying not far from a stream that used to flow there. So from this, you can already suspect that the bones have moved a bit and have been a bit transported by some water and are not maybe in their primary position as they used to be when they used to be butchered by the early humans. Let's investigate this more. If you look at the ribs, you have some of the ribs here, the ones that are represented here, one, two, three, those ribs are still attached together. So clearly this means that part of the carcass of the rhino was still intact and was not butchered by early humans. So this was not butchered by early humans. You still had flesh around those uh, ribs of the rhino when it was uh, covered by the sediments. So not the full carcass, not the full animal was butchered by early humans. Some of the ribs here, you have a rib that broke and you see that the two pieces are still close to each other and they didn't move much from each other. This has been found here. That's this rib. And this is just like for the lower leg before, due to the compaction of the sediments. So sediments covered the rhino after it was butchered and then the pressure of the sediment broke the bone inside the sediment. That's what you have here. So the ribs broke but they didn't move far, far from each other because they were buried and uh, contained by the sediments. Another type of ribs, these are uh, small uh, fragments you have here, but you have the same here as well. Fra three fragments of one same rib that broke, and you see that this part refits with this part and this part with this part. So it broke in three pieces and each piece shift towards each other. And this is also related to a small transport while uh, depositing and most likely that the rib broke during a, a short transport within the sediment, 
we have another evidence of this. This is this one. That's the one that is represented here. So it broke during the transport. Each piece moved from each other, but it also broke inside the sediment. And that's the uh, small fragments you have here, but that are still attached to each other. So two times. It has been transported. The carcass, some of the bones broke a bit, at least the fragile one, just like the ribs. Some others broke after cover, being covered by the sediments. And you have a third type of ribs, this type, small triangular one with very sharp edges. You have one example here, this triangle, you have another one here, you have another one there. This small triangular shaped with very uh, sharp edges rib is most certainly the result of fracturation, breakage by these early humans. And this was made prior to the transport. So what do we have? Several information. Let's put that back in order. You have the bones of a rhino that are all concentrated in one area. These bones you can see here have a main orientation. Main orientation means that they have been pushed in the same direction by some natural force. And this direction is similar to the direction of the stream that was flowing there. So this rhino has been following the stream bed. It doesn't mean that it was transported by the, the water, but at least it has followed the bed of the stream and they all orientated in one way. We have evidences for these small transports by the ribs that broke during the transport. Then it was covered by the sediment, and once it's a sediment, some of the bones broke even more. But we also have some of the bones that were butchered by the early humans prior to this transport. And that's one of these examples here. And these small triangular shapes rib, fragment of ribs that you have here, are all found in this area of the excavation. And one can suspect, you can suspect, that the smaller fragments, if you had any transport, the smaller fragments were transported far away from the butchery place, from the original butchery place. So if those small fragments are found there, you can suspect that the rhino was butchered somewhere there or a few meters from there and was transported on a short distance, on a short distance because those small fragments are still found close to the rest of the rhino bones. If it um, was transported on a longer distance, then it would be scattered away in a much larger area and not concentrated like it is in here in a small area. So the rhino was butchered and then it was transported somehow. Therefore, we cannot, for such an old site, reconstruct the social activity and how these early humans grouped around the rhino and butchered it. But we still have the activities. We just do not have the process of these activities. You can see this main elongation of the rhino bones that, is, that are mostly oriented southeast northwest. And this same orientation that you have in the scattering of the pebbles here. These are the pebbles we found along with the rhino by type and by weight. And you can see that they have the same uh, main pattern of orientation from southeast to northwest, scattering. We suspect that this rhino was transported not by the stream, but because of the type of sediment we found covering the rhino, that this rhino was transported by a mud flow. We have several evidences on which I will not uh, detail much, but we have several evidences in the sediments of uh, the past activity of a volcano. So sometime you had a volcano that erupted. It destroyed the landscape where the rhino was butchered and 
usually after uh, volcanic eruption, the atmospheric uh, pressure increase and then it rains. And because there's no more vegetation, then uh, you have landslide. And that's exactly what happened there. You had a landslide and the rhino was transported from the place it was butchered to this small stream, uh, bed stream, but transported only on a small, on a short distance. So we have several evidences of these volcanic activities, some of which we can use to date the volcanic eruption. This is one of the trench we made, I've shown you in the introduction above the site. And below you have uh, the excavation square. And from this, we have several uh, particles in the sediments we can date. We can date with a method we call argon-argon. And this method is based on volcanic eruption and uh, the cooling down of the uh, lava that cools down into uh, rocks and while cooling down traps uh, the gas. And this gas can be dated. That's the argon-argon method. And when we dated it, these uh, stones that are the products of the volcanic eruption, we got an age of 1 million years. So the volcanic eruption happened 1 million years ago. We also used another method to date directly the bones. So that's the age of the sediments that, uh, or at least the particles of, that are inside the sediments that covered the rhino. But we also have dates for the bones themselves. This is what we call the uranium series. Uranium, that is a radioactive uh, atom, can, uh, is a, can penetrate inside the bones or inside your cave here, thanks to water. So it's transported by water and can penetrate into stones or into bones whenever they are permeable. And this uranium being uh, radioactive decay over time into another atom that is thorium. Thorium is not permeable. So it cannot be transported by water. This means that water that infiltrates your bones accumulate uranium, but not thorium. Therefore, when the bones are deposited in your site, the uranium is one, represent 100% of the composition of the bones. And then once it's trapped by the sediments, it decays into thorium. So by measuring the ratio between uranium and thorium, you can date the age of the, ray, the, the bones, at least the deposition of the bones. This is what we used, combined with another method that we call electrospin resonance. You know about carbon-14, I guess. So carbon-14 is the pollution of carbon in the atmosphere by the addition of a neutron in the nitrogen-14 that transform into carbon-14. And while doing so, there is uh, expression of a proton. And this proton will fall back on Earth. This is palliated elements. And those palliated elements fall back on Earth and accumulate in the sediments. Once they are at the exposure of the sunlight. Once, once they are covered from the sunlight, these protons do not accumulate anymore. So this layer accumulated protons by the time it was on the surface, and then once buried by more sediments, stopped to accumulate them. So by recording the amount of protons, we can date the sediments, but also the bones. So we combined both, and we got an age of 700,000 years for the rhino bones. So this is the age of the butchery time, the time by which the rhino was butchered shortly transported and then quickly buried. So we know that humans represent 700,000 years ago in the Philippines. If you compare now with what you have in Southeast Asia, in the rest of Southeast Asia, then you have rhinos, stegodons, and uh, some other animals. 
by 700,000 years ago, by the same time that in Java, you have rhinos, stegodon of other species, but still comparable, that are the same age, 800,000 years ago, and in which you have Homo erectus. And on Flores Island here, you have Homo forensis. So in Kalinga, we do not have the human remains. We have the activities of those humans. We have the evidences that these humans were present. And we can only suspect that it was either Homo erectus or another endemic island species, just like you have on Flores, and just like you have now on Luzon, in Kalo uh, cave site that is dated to 70,000 years ago. So maybe we have the ancestor of Homo luzonensis. Was it already Homo luzonensis or was it the transition form, something that looked like more like Homo erectus? That we do not know. And that's what we need to investigate more now. So excavation is continuing in Kalinga. Well, by the time there is no uh, pandemic crisis, of course. So whenever we can excavate, we excavate every year and students are always welcome to the site. So if you are interested in that, you are most welcome. And I think I've been quite long and I'm sorry, Dr. Pavlik, and I give you back the mic. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Injiko. This was a... No, no, that was wonderful. Uh, thanks, really, thanks for the excellent and, and very comprehensive presentation on, on the story and, and the research history of, of this famous Kalinga rhinoceros. So this was really beautiful and I'm, I'm very happy to hear that the project is continuing and we are just waiting for the pandemic uh, to end and uh, it will be great seeing you back in the Philippines and, and working in, in Kalinga. So now I, I like to introduce our respondent, Ms. Mylene Leasing of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology of Ateneo de Manila University and the Prehistoric Archaeology Department of the Goethe University Frankfurt in Germany. She is a member of ASEA, the cultural deputy for Cagayan Valley of the National Museum of the Philippines and the consultant for cultural heritage of the office of the governor of Cagayan province. Mylene Leasing graduated with an MA in archeology span at the University of the Philippines and holds an international master's degree in quaternary prehistory. She's also the recipient of a prestigious Lisa Maskell fellowship of the Gerda Henkel Foundation and is currently completing her PhD at Goethe University. Mylene is an expert in hominin studies and in archaeological heritage management and the promotion of the human story to the general public. She's also a member of the Kalinga project. She participated in the excavation and serves as the project's liaison officer. So like Dr. Inchiko, she knows the Kalinga rhino in person, so to speak. Mylene, thank you for being with us today and for agreeing to be the respondent. Thank you very much, Alfred, for that very uh, charitable introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's very good to see you, um, Alfred and Toma. Wow, um, fantastic presentation. Uh, and you know, it just makes me miss the site so much because this would be the time of year that we would be in Kalinga or at least preparing to be there, right? Um, it's May 11. So, um, and uh, we, have, we didn't have our excavations last year and we're not having it again this year. But as Thomas said, uh, the excavation continues and as soon as the pandemic allows us or goes away and allows us to go there, uh, we will be resuming once again. And for those of you who are interested uh, to join us, I would be the person to get in touch with because I am here in Manila. Um, and I help out with the organization and administration uh, part of, of the, um, the excavations in Kalinga. So um, thank you very much, Toma, for sharing about Kalinga. And uh, 
I, I think this is the best lecture you've ever given so far. Um, your graphics are awesome. I've never seen uh, your graphics uh, look so good. Um, this is the first time I've seen them in, in your lecture. Uh, so for students, um, we were asking, we would want to ask ourselves, why, why would something like this be important? Why do we need to know about uh, research that's being done or why do we need to know about what happened 700,000 years ago in the Philippines uh, and why should research like this continue and why should funding for such research continue uh, we need to look at this and we might want to look at this in the context in our context as a developing country where we have so many things um, that are on our priority list of needs Yet, why would something like this be important to us? And uh, as in archaeology, it's very important to look at the context. Um, what Toma has found, what our team ha has found, and what Alfred finds um, uh, specimens and materials in, in uh, excavation, the material itself is not the only thing that has value. The whole context has value, and that is why we need to excavate properly. So it's the same thing when we look at it from our perspective as students and lay people. Um, we must look at the bigger context. Um, what do we learn? Why is it important to have this research? What can we learn about how humans interacted with uh, the environment and the fauna 700,000 years ago? Um, what can we learn about human behavior um, and social interactions, although uh, it's very difficult, as Toma pointed out, it's very difficult to, to, um, to deduce from what we have in Kalinga about social interactions from 700,000 years ago. Uh, what is the history of humanity beyond, beyond political borders, beyond physical borders, and even beyond temporal borders? And does this contribute to our understanding of ourselves, of one another? Um, and uh, how do we apply this to our current situation when things happen, such as this pandemic now? How, how is it relevant to us? Uh, and these are the things, uh, these are the reasons why we ask ourselves, why is this research uh, important? Now, the second thing is also involving the locals uh, in Rizal, Kalinga itself. We have been working in Kalinga since 2014, and Toma has always emphasized that we involve the locals, that we keep the locals informed about what we are doing. So I don't know if we are the first, uh, but we are probably one of the first groups uh, of archaeological researchers who have allowed the public to come freely and to watch us freely and to actually ask questions why we are working in the site. And then we also give lectures to the locals when we are there, not only to the locals and only to the school children, but including the, the uh, municipal employees and, and um, the government employees, because we need to, to, to uh, help the people develop an appreciation for their cultural heritage. And this is part of the cultural, the heritage of uh, the place where they live in. And um, I, I won't say too many things. I just want to end with, um, we've been there since 20, 2014. So that's what, eight years, Toma? Yeah. And we've actually been working with the locals ever since uh, we started working in Rizal Kalinga. But it's a long process and it's not an easy process to develop their understanding and appreciation of the research, of the, result, of the results of the research. And um, personally, I thought that we could come up with a plan for them and turn it over to them, uh, for them to implement so that they could disseminate information and develop their heritage management for themselves. But um, as we go along, and um, even this absence now from Rizal is teaching us that uh, the way really to sustainability uh, for heritage management and developing appreciation for research and making it relevant in the current context is really to build capacity for the locals to manage it themselves and to educate themselves, to develop skills to do this, uh, to empower them, and to also continue our collaboration with them. Thank you. So why is it uh, important? What do we search for these uh, early humans? Um, 
Indeed, at first it can look a bit um, irrelevant or at least quite distant from us. Because as I said in the introduction, uh, they are our ancestors, but not our, our direct ancestors. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, your ancestors arrived much more recent than uh, 700,000 years ago. Though there were another humanity inhabiting the Philippines much before uh, the current uh, Philippine people arrived. Yet, you arrived on a land that um, became your property, that you try to fructify, to take the best of it, and uh, to take everything that was in it. And in it were some fossils. So somewhere they are yours, and uh, you have the uh, right on it, but also uh, you have the duty to take care of it and to uh, be concerned about them. And this is important not only because this is somehow still some of the roots of the Philippines, but much more than that, because they are not only ancestors of uh, the Philippines, but also ancestors of humanity. So these are the roots of humanity, and this is one way to make the best of what's in the Philippines and to share with other people and to have in common with other people. So this is why it is important to look for these early humans. They arrived, how did they arrive? How did they live? How did they survive? How did they make the best of what was in the Philippines back then? That's the same question we can ask nowadays to uh, people living in the Philippines or in any places uh, in the world. So uh, it is important to um, forget about yourself, to look at something else, to stop at look uh, at yourself in the mirror, but to look at yourself through other ways. So uh, it was a in very important discovery uh, in science uh, when we realized that uh, uh, Earth was not in the center of the universe, but the sun was and Earth was just revolving around. It is similarly important to realize that we are not the top of the evolution, we are not the center of it. And if we want to know more about us, we have to study us in another way. And one of the way is to study our ancestors. And through that um, filter, we will know more about ourselves. And this is why we involve the local uh, with us. They, this is their land, their property somehow. They have a duty over it. And they have to feel concerned. And they do feel concerned. They are very involved. And as you said, they want to uh, be totally part of it. And even when we receive uh, public in the area, general audience, school boys, it is not only us who explain, but most of the time, it is the locals who excavate with us, who take the lead and explain what's there. And this is very important to us because they have to feel responsible and they do feel responsible. They are the one preserving those important fossils for the history of the Philippines. I hope I answered your questions. Yes, th thank you very much, Mylene and Thomas for the response. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. So this, uh, absolute uh, very vital and important takeaways and, and points. And, and uh, as Thomas says, it, it, we really we have to look at the bigger picture and, and we have to look beyond our own uh, desire, so to speak. Um, may I now turn over to my co-host, uh, Mr. Aido Balboa, who will lead through the question and answer section. We have uh, already a few questions, I think, in the chat box. All right. Thank you, Dr. Pavlik. Uh, thank you, ma'am, Mylene, please. And uh, thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Nchiko. It was a wonderful presentation. And yes, the visuals were, they were great, especially for a non-expert like me. I, I really appreciated it. Um, well, uh, we have a few good points in the chat box. Um, but I'll read some questions um, from the registration. This one's from um, 
Dr. Ferdinand Salagan from Buntinlupa Science High School. Um, he asks, how do these new developments and issues impact the historical knowledge and identity of Filipino people today? Well, as I said in the introduction, for the longest time, um, the earliest presence of humans in the Philippines was in Taban Cave, so 30, 40, 100 years ago, depends on the date you use. And somehow, the Philippines, this uh, huge country, this huge archipelago in islands of East Asia, was uh, out of the picture of early people. For the longest time, you had Indonesia in uh, a country from which you know uh, early humans dating back to 1.5 million years ago, since uh, the end of the 19th century and the uh, uh, early work of uh, Eugène Dubois, so the very first fossils discovered there, and that attracted most of the attention. And surprisingly, the Philippines were not uh, on that map. It started to be on the map when Dr. Pavlik discovered Hendax in Aubo. Unfortunately, it was on surface, but at least it was a point to say that you also had uh, archaic humans and old Paleolithic in the Philippines. So that uh, uh, and um, how to say that enrooted deep in time the history of the Philippines. That was the first uh, milestone. So now with Kalinga, we have an age, we have uh, fossil fauna, so we can compare with other fossils in Southeast Asia to see where they are coming from, for instance. So we know that people were in the Philippines, but from where did they come? Was it from Indonesia, from China? So these are all the questions that relate. And um, this is uh, so much information added to the history of the Philippines, I believe. All right, um, thank you. And um, there's another question from Elizabeth Enerio from a faculty from Xavier University, um, Ateneo de Cagayan. Um, she's asking if, uh, or she's asking, um, what are the ongoing researches of the um, national history in Paris uh, on the Philippines? So if you would like to um, tell us, Dr. Inchiko. Uh, so we are, we are still excavating every year in Kalinga, and uh, as uh, Mylene Nissin said, we are welcoming uh, students. Not so many because we cannot uh, welcome many people, even researchers, we are limited. But uh, the excavation is ongoing. Uh, whenever there is no pandemic, of course, unfortunately. Uh, so this is uh, one of the main involvements of the uh, Museum of uh, natural history in Paris. Another one is uh, one of my colleagues, Florent Detroit, who's taking part of the research in Calao with Dr. Miraros and who contributed to the discovery of uh, the new species Homo Lusensis. That is also to complete on the, the earlier question, um, uh, an important discovery and a new step in the history of the Philippines and to put back the Philippines as part of the, the picture of uh, the prehistory of uh, Southeast Asia. All right, um, Dr. Pavlik, um, we may continue. We can hear you, Alfred. Uh, as usual, <laughs> um, we are we are almost at the end of uh, our presentation and the webinar with. Uh, Dr. Inchiko and Mylene Leasing. Um, I would briefly take this opportunity to, to welcome uh, Dr. Kyle Latinis, uh, who in, in, the chat bunk, uh, in the chat box uh, raised a few very good aspects. And if I may just uh, read that, uh, he says, I think some of the most important aspects of the research are one, multidisciplinary approach, methodology. Two, multiple data set integration to understand the basic nature of the sites, remains, environments, ecologies, and changes. 
as well as dating activities and evolutionary theory and process in general. And third, Philippines and Southeast Asia are critically important to understanding the global picture. And I think this, this is really just well said and, and puts it to the point and, and demonstrates the, the relevance and importance of, of Thomas research and of, of the research that we, we see in the Philippines and Southeast Asia um, appearing in, in the recent years that, that put the entire region uh, not only on the map, but made it actually a hotspot in, in current research on archeology span and prehistory. So thank you, Dr. Latinis for these comments. Okay, uh, thanks again, Dr. Inchiko, Mylene. Uh, I'm very happy about today's webinar, the talk. It's, it's really wonderful, it was so informative and, and uh, I, I agree also with the fantastic presentation, the, the illustrations, the graphs are, are marvelous and uh, it was very enjoyable. Before we, we end our webinar, uh, let me please announce our next speaker. So in next week's webinar, we will be having Dr. Philip Piper from the Australian National University in Canberra. And he will present a probably quite delicious talk entitled, Pick Out the Origin and Prehistoric social and cultural significance of domestic pigs in the Philippines. So same day, same time, Tuesday, May 18th at 2 p.m. Okay, thank you very much for attending. Thank okay. you for joining. Sorry yes. to interrupt. May I uh, just yeah, also like to um, acknowledge the presence of Marian Reyes, who is uh, actually our second in command in the team when we're in excavation and co-author of our paper in Nature oh. Yeah, She's here with us right now. Hello, Hien. She's off cap. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mylene. Yeah, it's, it's really uh, great to have you all here. It's, even if, if it's the pandemic and, and we are all locked away in, in our homes, more we or less. Can adapt. Yeah, we can still adapt. Uh, and that's what uh, really makes our species, we adapt. Thanks again and hope to see you all next week. Bye-bye and take care, everyone. <laughs>